morning. 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 We're privileged to gather together freely. Worship, worship now the Word of God. Pray corporately to use our gifts to edify one another. And if there's anyone in our midst this morning who's an unbeliever, I pray that you would conclude surely God is in this place. We've been hit hard with some difficult providences during this virus. We had to say goodbye to one of our matriarchs, Jeannie Tiffany, our dear brother Greg Jessaroga. Some of your family members passed. Rachel Burke is now, her father passed away and she's out of town. Hospitalizations and sickness, loss of jobs and depression, and many hardships. We're praying for Claire Heller in a deep battle for her life this morning, and we rejoice that Justice came home from the hospital. But I testify that every one of these have a faith that's been purified and trusts God in a deeper, sweeter way. I've been blown away by everyone that I've reached out to on the phone and the way you're trusting Almighty God. And I give thanks to Him for His abundant grace during this time of pandemic. I'm grateful for so many things that God has done during this time. My heart has been so blessed with His faithfulness in our waiting. The manifested love from the saints has been unbelievable. There were meal trains, four or five at once, when it was hard to get groceries and you were going out and helping one another in your trials, running errands for the higher risk, steady flows of calls and texts, how can I help serve? The way you loved and helped some of the saints who did lose their loved ones during this time has been absolutely beautiful. Climaxing in the longest train of cars I've ever seen at Howard Tiffany's birthday drive-by. I've sat with many on my porch, pouring out their hearts and their desires to know Jesus Christ for the first time. Thousands of listeners listening to the gospel of Jesus Christ from Southside. So many of you witnessing on social media and in your neighborhoods. Seen salvations. Some wrestling and some of you still wrestling with your souls. I have members get saved. Kids writing cards to, to those who are sick and in need. Giving to alleviate financial pain. Church giving went up during the virus. It's crazy. I've talked with it's like God has pulled back a veil and He's been showing you what really matters and idols were being broken and thrown and smashed. Our test, the grace of God was manifested in our midst and so to Him be the glory in the church forever. Amen. And I want to join our hearts and give Him praise and thanks. So let's join together now as the people of God. Father, we come and we thank You. You did. You met us. In a very difficult season, in a difficult time, and many who will still journey in difficulty. And God, we thank You. Jesus Christ is all-sufficient. God, there is all-sufficiency in that sweet Savior. And You've met us and You've given us a hope that nothing can take away. God, we long for the new heavens and the new earth where we'll dwell with You forever. This is not paradise. This is not our home. There's no perfect government except Jesus Christ is King and citizens that love Him and love one another forever. God, we look and we long and we hope for that and we will continue to help one another to fight to fix our hope on that alone and not this world that's passing away. God, I pray this morning that You will meet us now in a powerful way as we worship through the Word of God. We finish up this section in Romans 3. Do Your intended work now in every heart and soul. In the hearing of this word, I pray. Amen. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. Good news. This morning we finish up the condemnation section that began in chapter 1, verse 18. And Paul's goal this morning is did this section finish you up? Did it finish you? Did it, did it do its accomplished intended purpose in your life? Did it work? Did it close your mouth? Accountable to God? By the law, no flesh will ever be justified? And do you see your sin 
And you just want to come to Christ to get rid of that big, dark blot. Don't move on without it. Don't try to continue in Romans unless it did its work in your heart. If you're still alive to anything in yourself, any hope of your own goodness or merit, approving the favor of God, do not move on or it'll just be morality and that damns. That will not save. And so this morning I want to make application of this section that we have been in. And so let's take some time and and do that examination together this morning. And I want everyone to look at your own hearts What did God do during this section? And for the believer, I pray that it's driven you deeper into the Gospel, that your flesh has been shut up again, and that our hearts are adoring and loving the grace of God. I have never treasured that word more in my life. The grace of God. Because I have no hope in anything other than Him doing and accomplishing salvation. An unbeliever, you're going to be tempted to let this bounce off. You're going to try to bring excuses and defenses and arguments against this gospel. To have a cold heart to God. Your whole Christian life has been this. You're not a Christian. You have no heart. You just kind of go back and forth. For a, you try for a day. You quit trying the next day. You just have lived in the same slop and you you can't get out of it. You go to church because your parents make you. It's a tradition. You sit through sermons that just bore you to death. You just keep playing the game and it's just all external. And honestly, there's just nothing internal if you'd be still and just look at your heart. To keep just trying to clean yourself up again and again, and make yourself right with God this morning, Paul says, stop. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying, and ask yourself the hard question, because I want you to hear this, one day God will. God will ask you this question. Have you been silenced before God? Have you come empty-handed with nothing in your hands to bring? Has He taken everything out of your hands that you want to try to bring and merit? Has the Word of God silenced you? This morning we'll look in verses 19-20 through for the conclusion of the matter. Here's your outline. Paul's going to give us four concluding statements regarding the law and our condemnation. God's instrument to shut our mouths is the law. His righteousness revealed to us is to shut our mouths, not to open them and climb on the law to heaven. We're going to look first at the extent of the law, the result of the law, the inability of the law, and then the ability of the law. What can the law do? So look with me in verse 19, the extent of the law. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Paul starts with kind of a real straightforward statement. Now we know. So his writers would have this knowledge. They would understand this. Whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, in the law. And there's some debate. Is this Jews under Mosaic law who concludes now with a universal application? Is this uh, kind of showing that the Jews were given the law and Even they, with all their privilege, could not keep it. So surely the Gentiles couldn't keep it. And it's to kind of shut Jew and Gentile's mouth. And I think there's a very good argument for that case. The other would be that whatever realm you're in, whatever realm, Jew or or Gentile, is what you're responsible for. And in chapter 1, there's a general revelation that says by creation you should give God honor, glory, and thanks And you're responsible for that. To seek Him out and to know that God. And what happened is they suppressed it. The Gentiles have revealed in their constitution or nature morality. Certain things even in the law that that they have by, by their creation. The way God made them. And the Jews have the Decalogue. They were given the revealed will of God. What is required of them from Moses. 
And then we looked at Romans 3, 8 through 18 last week. And we saw that that was the Psalms in Isaiah that he quoted and just shot one after another, not the Pentateuch. And so just the, the Word of God itself will, will silence you. And now we have the New Testament Scriptures with the Law of Christ and the Sermon on the Mount. You heard, don't, don't murder, but I say if you even get angry. Don't, don't commit adultery, but if you even lust. And so there's this higher standard of the heart under the New Covenant for the believer. And what he says is you're responsible. There's no one outside of it. All have law, all have the righteousness of God that's been revealed. And his argument this morning is all the world has some kind of rule or standard or revelation and nobody's exempt before God. You're responsible to the law, to the revelation of of righteousness. So no matter what God has revealed, whatever form of revelation, our fallen hearts are in rebellion to God and we love unrighteousness and we suppress it and we disobey it. God's standard meets with the human heart And the offspring is rebellion and sin. It never produces righteousness. Here's the law. And it comes to a rebellious heart. And righteousness just can't come out of this relationship. All it does is reveal sin. Flesh cannot beget righteousness. So the gospel is we need another kind. If we're ever going to be right with God, it's going to have to come from outside of us. Because inside of us, no matter how perfect the standard of righteousness is, it can't produce it. It only shows our rebellion and our sin and our unrighteousness. Charles Hodge said, Those to whom any revelation of the divine will is made are bound to be conformed to it. (coughs) What the law written in the heart says, it says to those who have that law. And what the law as written in the Scriptures says, It says to those who have the Scriptures. The extent of the law is this revelation. In whatever area we've seen in Romans 1-3 through that you've received, Paul has showed sufficiently all have disobeyed the revelation that God has given. My second point is I want to look then at the extent or the result of the law. The result of the law in verse 19. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law And this is a henna clause, which means what's the purpose? The purpose is so every mouth may be closed and all the world might become accountable to God. Very simple. The law is to shut mouths and make you accountable to God. Paul's going to bring us into a courtroom. And now we are the accused. We're the defendant. As we come in and stand before the bar of God and His righteousness, His perfect, revealed heart, character, who He is. So there's a purpose in that. That every mouth may be closed. I want to put a hand on every mouth this morning is what He's saying. There's no defense when you stand before this God. You can be cool right now and brag to your friends and, and put down Christians and make your mockeries. But on this day, I'm telling you, there will be no defense. God's law, His law renders the whole world speechless. <coughs> There'll be no excuses for our lives before this God. We live in a nation where you can try to get out of almost anything. And if you hire the right lawyers and they come with their smooth, trickery ways, you almost can get out of anything. Excuses help. In our land. But when you stand before God, we all know we're we're guilty. And we're going to deserve condemnation. And we're going to be speechless. There'll be no arguing. There'll be no debating. There'll be no calling in of witnesses. The whole world is under this righteousness of God. The Jews were given it in writing. And the Jews made the mistake of thinking that made them special. Paul's saying, no, it was given to you to shut your mouth. But it did the opposite. It's opened your mouth and you're boasting that you're better than everyone else on the face of the earth. It's supposed to shut your mouth and it's opened your mouth instead. 
Paul says, I, I'm, I'm telling you, it was to given it that it might be closed. And this is a, a passive, meaning God will shut it. His, his righteousness is to close it. It's a, the old verb meant to fence you in, to block up. It was used in Le, uh, Hebrews 11.33 to shut the mouths of lions when Daniel was in the lion's den. Why? Because this is God's tribunal. It's not an earthly tribunal. There will not be loopholes or briberies or mistakes or appeals. And I don't think we get this. Every mouth will be silenced. <coughs> A holy, righteous God. And you're going to stand before Him with guilt, guilt, guilt. You're not a Christian unless your mouth has been silenced before God by this righteousness. Before God, every mouth has to be silenced. The Greek word pan, pan, it means all or every. It, it draws out the emphasis that every single mouth will be shut. When we, when we stand before God, our lips will utter no excuses. We don't know what it's like to be silenced. We always have something more to say. When we see God as He is in all of our sin, we're just going to be silenced. Donald Gray Barnhouse, a famous pastor, he used to, his, fa his favorite question to ask somebody is, what right do you have? If God, you stood before God on the last day, and He said, what right do you have to come into my heaven? What would you say? No one will ever be able to say, I've done this or I've done that. The law of Christ to love God with your, all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbor as yourself, it comes and it shuts every mouth. This Greek word literally means to shut up. To shut it. And so I'm going to go through some examples. And um, uh, when we were growing up, I remember one time uh, Jordan, his, his grandmother was watching him and when he came home he said, Mom... Grammy used the S word. She's like, what? She said, yeah, she said shut up. So I just say this. I'm not using it to be rude in a way of our vernacular, but I want you to hear the Greek word and what it means this morning. What I want to ask you is have you, not your friend, not your kids, have you been silenced in the presence of God? To say I don't think I like wrath, it's outdated. Judgment, according to the secrets of my heart, a whole heart's going to be open and laid bare before God. Silence your mouths. He's going to go right into the depths of even your heart and what you think and what you've done your whole life. I'm just a good guy. I go to church. I'm better than my brother-in-law. I've never killed anyone this morning. Close your mouth. I don't agree with Romans 1 on sexual sin and homosexuality. I think you're born that way. I don't think it's sin. Be quiet. Be quiet. All my friends party and have so much fun. There's no way everybody's wrong. We're just good people at heart. Be quiet. Be silenced. I condemn all the world by the word of God. I, I'm okay. I'm the one. I'm righteous. And I tell everybody else where they're unrighteous. Be silenced this morning before God. I teach the law. My doctrine is impeccable. I instruct the foolish. Will I live the exact same way? Let it close your mouth this morning. I'm circumcised. I was baptized. I went to First Baptist Church of Jonestown. My grandparents started the church. Surely I'm okay. Be quiet. I don't think God will judge me. I like to think God's just love. And He doesn't really get all worked up like you're talking. Be silenced before this God. 
I do some righteous things. I help the needy. I do all kinds of good things. And Paul says there's none. There's no one righteous, not even one. Be quiet. I'm a good person. I'm so different than this world that's burning up buildings and being prejudiced and all the things that are going on in our land. I wear a mask so nobody gets the virus. There's none good. Not even one. Be silenced. I'm seeking God. He's everything to me. No, there's none who seek after God rightly and truly for all of His beauty. Be silenced. What about, I, don't, I, I think that there's evolution. I don't, I don't agree with all this creation. Be silenced. What if I try really hard to change my bad habits and the things that I struggle with? No flesh will be justified by the law. Be silenced. Are you still filled with arguments this morning? I go to Southside Bible Church. Be silenced. Are you still filled with righteousness and goodness this morning? Has three chapters of painful analysis in God's portrait of who you are and what you've done. If last week there's none who seek after God, there's none righteous, there's none good. If it, if it hasn't silenced you, that's what has to take place to receive the grace of God. You sit here this morning, I am so bad, I can never be saved if it's up to me. I pray that you would be quiet. Your goodness will never, ever make you acceptable to God. And your badness doesn't push God away. Through the law comes the knowledge of sin. It makes you the object that God desires to save. Jesus Christ was the friend of sinners. So if you sit here this morning, I haven't done enough to be right with God in a loving way. Shut up. I have done so much. I can never be forgiven. Paul says, be quiet. Do you see the Gospel this morning? Do you see the waters you must traverse to receive God's beautiful gift of salvation in His Son? Paul was not a mean guy. He's doing this so you would be blessed beyond blessing. But you must be silenced before Him in regards to your own righteousness and in regards to your sin. The Gospel's simple. You must turn from yourself and turn to Christ. You'll never do that until you're silenced. You can't have both. They can't be married, but God is separated. Let no man join together. You can't have it. You need to be silenced. You can never re receive salvation unless your mouth has been quieted. So I ask you this morning, are you done? To be quiet means you're done with yourself. Has God brought you to that sweet place where you're finally done with pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and trying again to clean yourself up and to go to church and be better are you done? I don't care if you got 30 years of church attendance under your belt. Are you done? Too many sit in the church who aren't done. The only way out of this horrible picture that we painted last week is not I'm sorry for my sin, but I'm sorry for the reason that I have never done anything right my whole life. I'm curved inward and everything I've ever done has self as a center reference point. That's my depravity. And now if you're silenced, you're at a place to receive. To those who received Jesus Christ, He gave the right to become children of God. So you'll never receive this Gospel until you're done with yourself. You won't turn to nothing but Jesus alone until everything in you has died. 
Are you there? Are you ready to receive the free gift of God and salvation? So I want you to hear this. John Gerstner said, Because of the Gospel, the way to God is wide open. No sin can hold you back (coughs) because God has offered justification to the ungodly. Nothing else stands between you and God but your good works. What's, What's between you and God is your good works. The only cost. (coughs) One second, please. The only cost. And I want you to hear this. Oh, Holy Spirit, let them hear this. The only cost is your empty hand. Please hear that. All you need is need. All you need is nothing in your hand. Except people don't have that. And they don't want to sit under Romans 1 through 3 and be pierced and cut. So finally, there's nothing left in your hand at all. There's no moral resolve. There's nothing you can look to. There's no hope in anything in you. You don't have, look at all the good things I've done. The call this morning is to repent of your sin, but to repent of the reason for why you've never done anything right. It's because of your self-centered, curved-in nature. Everything I do, good or bad, is bad. It's polluted because the fountain is dirty, so the stream will always be dirty. God, my mouth is shut. Thou must save, and Thou alone. Amen? Amen? bless you. I'm going to read to you what will this look like. Paul said, I'm of the true circumcision. Here's a guy with a full hand. I worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised on the eighth day, the nation of Israel The tribe of Benjamin, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. It's a full hand. Until he saw Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. But whatever things were gained to me, all these things I thought were meriting me favor, those things I now have counted as loss, They were taking me away from God. I count them as lost for the sake of Christ. And more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, in order that I might gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. An empty hand looking to Christ and He gives me the righteousness that He requires to be in His presence. I was a man who was shut up to all of His flesh and all of His doing and all of His merit. And secondly, He said that all the world might become accountable to God. The Greek word meant exposed to judgment. uh, To become... Here's how it would be worded. Exposed to judgment, become all the world to God. All the world is cosmos. The whole world, and all of it is that the whole world would become accountable to God. This word for accountable is used only one time. There are other Greek words to show guilt. But this was a forensic or a legal term. We're back into this legal courtroom. It was always associated with law courts. And it carries the idea of being liable before God, exposed to judgment. The the whole section that we've studied, (coughs) Paul said you're under the wrath of God, Jew or Gentile, whether you're good or bad. That's why we need a gospel. And so don't miss what Paul has done. He's shown you that you're guilty and you're not righteous. 
The law has not made you righteous, just the opposite. You can rub up against it your whole life. People have been doing it for thousands and thousands of years. They're rubbing against the law, and Paul says it will never justify you. It can never make you righteous. We need a gospel that reveals the righteousness of God, a God kind of righteousness, because we have none of our own, and just trying by the law will never get us any. You'll never get it. You're accountable to God. And you can try to talk your way out of it and argue and ignore it, but you'll die and you'll stand before the bar of God who knows. And you're going to be judged in truth by the standard of His perfect righteousness. No curve. And so do you feel your need this morning if the shoe fits? Thirdly, I want you to look at the inability of the law in verse 20. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in His sight. This word for therefore is one of the strongest Greek words for therefore. It's the first occurrence in the Greek text so far in Romans. And it means on account of which thing. This here is the conclusion of all that's been said then in our first section. This word should cause your ears to kind of prick up. How is this great argument that we've been studying going to be summarized? What is it that Paul has been driving so hard at from 118 all the way to current? Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. The law was to make you aware of sin. By doing the law, <coughs> no flesh will have this guilt removed. No one will remove the wrath of God by being good. I don't know how more clear you can say it. No one can make themselves be in a right standing with God by law keeping. If you get nothing else from this church, I pray you get this. It's not enough to know this academically. Have you come to this point in your life where you've realized that all of your morality, all of your religiosity, all of your tears, all of your beggings and your pleadings can do nothing to remove your guilt. Those things will not do it. The law will never do that. Have you been made desperate like this and fled to Christ? Is it academic or is it soul desperation? Where he, he, he labored at this long and hard not so that you could just learn some arguments, but God wants you desperate. Say, thou must save and thou alone. Get a little desperate for grace. Not treat it like it's just another thing in this world. It's got to move from just academic to a desperation. I need to be saved and I can't do it myself. Top lady said it so well. Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure, save from wrath and make me pure. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. These for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. In my hand no price I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I rise to worlds unknown and behold thee on thy throne, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. The law can never do that. It was never intended to do that. The law has no power to make you right with God. And so my last point then is what does, can the law do the ability of the law as we close out is for, through the law comes the knowledge of sin. The law is holy. The law is righteous and good. It shows God's righteousness. And it shows us the beauty of God. And I always like that illustration of Quasimodo when he looked at Esmeralda. And he said, I never realized how ugly I was until I saw how beautiful you were 
And, and the righteousness of God is so lovely that it reveals who we really are before this God. I was thinking this week, uh, someone maybe who's born just deformed and hideous looking. And all they've been told their whole lives is you're beautiful. You're absolutely beautiful and there's no mirrors on this island. And one day this person stumbles on a mirror and you look into it and all of a sudden you realize I'm hideous. This mirror is showing you who you really are. And you can change the mirror and say, I don't like what I see. How do I know God gave me this mirror? Or I can start rubbing up against the mirror to try to change myself. And say, I'm beautiful. I don't care what you say, mirror. I, woo, I can't hear you. I'm beautiful. Other people think I'm good looking. The guy down the road is way uglier than I am. Stop and look in the perfect law of liberty and see who you really are. And don't suppress it and ignore it and explain it away and try to just say, I'm a pretty good guy. This is who you are, friend. Apart from the grace of God. Romans 7.13, Therefore did that, the law, which is good, become a cause of death for me. May it never be, rather it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. It might show you what sin is and it's transgression. It's against this beautiful, glorious God. And it's to make sin utterly sinful to see that I'm not just a good guy. Has this section silenced you? There's none righteous, not even one. There's none who understand you can't figure this out on your own. There's none who seek after God. You won't find Him by your own seeking. There's a, all have turned aside. They've turned away from God and they've become worthless. There's none who does good, not even one, and their mouths manifest their hearts with evil and maliciousness and slander, gossip. And there's a meanness that they're swift to shed blood and they just can't find peace. And they, they, there's no fear of God before their eyes. I can't do anything to make myself right before God. That's the end of our section. What do I do? Thanks, Barnabas. What do I do? In verse 21, we'll begin next week. Five weeks, we're going to stare at the cross. But now. This is why there's hope. This is why I've been coming at you so hard not to hurt you, to bless you with eternal life. I want everyone in this church to have your mouth silenced before God. Empty-handed. Nothing to bring. And now look, that there's a way to get right with God. There's a righteousness, a perfect righteousness that God requires. But now He's going to give it to you next week apart from the law. Apart from your working. Apart from your merit. It's a gift. It's called grace. He's going to use this redundancy. It's grace. It's a free gift. Same thing. Just to keep barreling and say it's by faith. It's by faith. He's going to show you, but now there's a way to be saved. There's a way that you can be right with the Creator as a sinner and no hope in yourself. You have a God who's full of grace and He's given His Son to bring about a salvation from this horrible, desperate place that we've been looking at. If you become desperate, there's an amazing uh, solution to your problem. There's a remedy, but now... Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. I'm not ashamed of this gospel because in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. This gospel is revealing the righteousness that can save you this morning. <laughs> I'm first going to stare our eyes out for the next few months and my heart is just being overwhelmed with the rest of Romans 3. And we're gonna, I wanted to move quicker through Romans, but you don't move quickly through the cross. And we're just going to park and I pray that if your mouth has been shut up, 
and you're desperate, I'm just going to hold up this beautiful Christ as a diamond and every week we'll look at a facet and just look your eyes out until the healing and salvation of your soul takes place. And, and as a believer, to just stare and marvel and love grace all the more. Grace. Sweetest, sweetest name I know. One of my heroes of the faith made me think of him this morning was George Whitfield. He used to preach to 10,000 people in fields, sometimes 20,000, and they didn't have speakers. Thank you, Taylor, by the way. Uh, 20,000 people. It says that in 34 years of public ministry, it's believed that Whitfield preached in excess of 30,000 times. There were some weeks in which he would speak for 40 to 60 hours. Preaching for 40 to 60 hours in a week. On his birthday, he wrote this. Oh, that I could do more for him. (laughs) Oh, that I was a flame of pure and holy fire and had a thousand lives to spend in my Redeemer's service. The sight of so many perishing souls as I've never seen clear in our country ever. It just affects me so much. And it makes me long to go, if possible, from pole to pole to proclaim redeeming love in Jesus Christ. (laughs) Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. I pray that this gospel will take over your heart. It won't be mental ascent. It will be transformation in life. And that you will give the rest of the days you have on this earth to spread this gospel. It's, It's so needed in our land and in this world. And I don't want to just come back together and do church. The world needs us more than it's ever needed us. It needs a place where there's oneness and there's not all this fighting and prejudice and divisiveness. It's just one with a message of salvation. And we we join hands and we're unified and we're going to do everything we can to take this message anywhere and everywhere until we die. And we've got to open up when we can legally uh, bring people in your homes, bring them to your churches, to your community groups. This gospel has to take over your heart and not be stale and cold. I want you to, to come with me for the next five weeks if God tarries and, and just say, God, make this alive in my heart like Whitfield. Let me just have where it burns and I have to go tell it and I'll go from pole to pole if that's what it takes. I refuse to let this gospel be cold in my heart or in your hearts. And so I pray that if anything happened in being locked away for three months, that we'll come out just ready to run for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords with this message. And so may we gather together as a church and take this message to the ends of the earth. Amen? Well, I missed something very special that I'm going to do this morning while we were locked away, and it was Easter, okay? <laughs> something that I need. And, and in light of what I'm talking about, this Jesus went up on a cross, and He died in our place for our sins, and He, he was buried. And it looked like there was no hope, and on the third day He was raised again for God to say, there's justification in My Son. It's finished, it's done, It's accomplished. And all who will come to Him and believe will receive this righteousness to be right with me. And so He's no longer in a grave. He's been risen. And I want us to join together because that's our hope and that's our hearts as we go forward. He is risen. Louder. He's risen. He's risen. Thank you, kids. I needed to hear that with all my heart. Let's pray. Oh, Father, He is risen. We are filled with hope. We have life. We have eternal life. We have God. We have adoption and acceptance and power. Holy Spirit dwelling within us to go love You and love others like no others. God, let us shine. Let us be a city set on a hill and let the beautiful love that's flowing from this Gospel in our lives be shown and Unbelievers would come and see and taste it and want to know Jesus Christ. God, let us enter into the broken lives of this world and love and care and bring the saving message of Jesus Christ. 
God, let that be the deep, burning passion of every heart. And I pray this morning, if there's any here, God, whose mouths have not been shut, that this morning your Spirit finished it. Let them sit here silenced before God who knows the secrets of their heart and has a standard of perfect righteousness that they will be judged by. God, let it be over. Let it finish them. Give them the butt now. Let them look to this Gospel that can save and give a righteousness that our hands never could. Oh, the righteousness that have been pierced through, hands pierced through on our behalf and a law that was fulfilled by our perfect Savior. God, I pray that anyone in that place look and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ this morning and be saved. God, I thank You and it's in Jesus Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.